So this is a conversation with Jamie Bartlett, who's been investigating our complex relationship with technology for years through books like People vs. Tech, and recently through the hit podcast The Missing Crypto Queen, which investigated the astonishing story of the OneCoin scam. We talked about how technology sometimes took the place of religion. Well, firstly, people will uh, desperately try to change their behavior to please the algorithm. So it'll start that way. In a similar way, in medieval times, that you'd, you know, you'd try to do certain th- you know, certain number of prayers and the rosary. And I, you can see people think, you know, like, I need to learn how to make sure my YouTube channel do- is well judged by um, YouTube. So I've got to put in certain keywords and do certain things and put it online at a certain time. And you're already changing your behavior to please some technology that you don't understand. And it's not much of a jump before we have sort of offerings and prayers and all sorts of the real trappings of religion. How the explosion of visual content online was turning us into different kinds of people. We always hear about, you know, the, the Facebook and Google's advertising model means that, you know, attention spans are at a premium and clicks always win, which means lowest common, common denominator information rises to the top because it's more emotionally engaging. Some of that, we've just it just gets talked about an awful lot. But I think underneath that, something more fundamental is happening, that we are turning into a more emotional society. I think we're more a more visual society. We see many more videos now than we ever used to. We are sort of less literate. We spend less time reading deeply, which is associated with all kinds of, you know, empathy and, you know, willingness to understand alternative viewpoints. How the rise of tech was a fundamental challenge to democracy. All the various institutions that society had kind of built up over the last hundred years to try to control and manage living in a complex, you know, complex uh, um, democracy, representative democracy, was all based on a sort of analog, geographically based world where there was relatively limited information that could be sort of controlled and has suddenly, the same system has suddenly basically been overwhelmed by the flood of information and nothing we've built has can really control it. And about his famous run-in with Alex Jones. I would be crazy to just believe what government mainstream media tell me. I, I've never said you should believe, I've never said that you should always believe what government and mainstream tells you. I mean, if you're, if we're, I mean, we're looking at my report, my report about critical thinking. People, young people, any people who are critical thinkers should not only question what the establishment tells them, what the mainstream tells them, but I would also hope they would be equally critical and hold the same standards of evidence and information against alternative sources of information. Yeah, I'm but sure that goes on. That. I mean, I'm sure you would agree with that. I did a debate with Alex Jones about, about this, right? And all I ever said to him was, why don't you apply the same unbelievable standards of truth you're applying to the official narrative to your own narrative? Because your narrative has got more holes in it. Hope you enjoy this conversation. Jamie, welcome. Thanks for having me. Cool. So I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. I loved your podcast, which maybe people watching will be familiar with, uh, The Missing Crypto Queen. Thanks. And you've been... And you've been... Um, Following this thread, so you've got other books, People versus Tech, and you've been really getting inside the nature of technology, what it's doing to us, the dark side of technology, all of these questions since for, for well over a decade. And so there's lots of topics I'd love to cover with you, but maybe for people who haven't encountered your latest work, we'll start with The Missing Crypto Queen, because I think there's so many dynamics there that are really fascinating, mm. like cult-like thinking, which is kind of everywhere at the moment, scams, cryptocurrency, like it's kind of got everything. Do you want to just summarize the story? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. It, in 2014, a woman that no one had ever heard of called Dr. Ruja Ignatova basically turns up and says, Bitcoin is this new brilliant cryptocurrency, but it's really, I mean, it's used by criminals. It's anarchic. It's decentralized. No one's in control of it. It's never really going to work. It's too slow. Me, however, I have a I have a PhD in law. I worked for years at McKinsey's. I'm a banking specialist. I can create a new Bitcoin and it's going to be even better. It's going to be bigger, faster, more user-friendly. 
And most of you Bitcoin people are geeks and nerds. This is for the ordinary man and woman on the street. And uh, she called it one coin. But the genius of it <laughs> was that it was sold not in the way that Bitcoin's bought and sold on exchange markets. It's sold through multi-level marketing. Now, you've probably never done multi-level marketing, but maybe your mother or father once did because my mum used to be an Avon lady. So you used to have these parties where she'd bring her friends around and that poor woman had to try and sell little tiny like perfume pots to her friends and family because that was the model. You, you buy a huge like garage full of product, sell it to your friends, get a commission, and then they have to sell it to their friends and they get a commission, but you also get a commission from the people that you've recruited into the scheme. It's a legal, it's a legal but very controversial business. And one of the reasons people find it difficult is because it's hard to shift vitamin tablets and health supplements and Avon stuff and Tupperware. So um, her genius was to say, this is like a multi-level marketing company, but instead of having to sell vitamins, you're selling the future of finance, cryptocurrency, something that's going to go up in value. Like I don't see Tupperware increasing in value, but this will. And it was such a brilliant idea to combine this tech that no one really understood, a virtual product with multi-level marketing, which just spreads like wildfire. And then within 18 months, a million people had invested like well over $4 billion into one coin. So many factors of the story and what was going on and the price kept going up, but the whole thing was a scam. She was just making up the price. No one understood it. Her blockchain technology behind one coin was secret, so you can't see it because if I showed it to you, everyone would try and steal it. That's how brilliant it is. I mean, it's such a good argument, isn't it? And then uh, in October 2017, she just disappeared, disappeared off the face of the earth, still hasn't been seen since. So the story was trying to uncover the scam, how it worked, why people get sucked in, the the sort of uh, the mechanics of, of multi-level marketing and why that's so powerful and sort of technology hype and how people get sucked in and trying to find what had happened to Dr. Ruja Ignatova. And it, yeah, it struck a chord with people uh, because crypto has gone everywhere. And the genius of it really is that, you know that line, people say it to each other all the time, if, oh, if it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. Yeah, Bitcoin sounded too good to be true as well. And yet that went from you know, $11 in 2013 to, well, what is it now? $60,000 for a Bitcoin? That sounds ridiculous. So when OneCoin turned up and said it could do something similar, people thought, yeah, anything's possible with it in this magical world of crypto. So she really understood how to play on people's fear of missing out, the, the tech hype, the regulatory failure, how slow the authorities, it's like a perfect scam, basically. It's like taking all these different elements and rolled it into one quite beautiful scam. But a million people have lost billions of dollars. Yeah, and you're, I'd really highly recommend if anyone hasn't listened to the podcast, I'd listen to it. I've just devoured it, I think. Um, and it really brought home some of the human stories because it's not just Western people who, there were people in kind of villages in, in Africa who persuaded all their friends to put money into the scheme. Like the, the human cost of it was quite huge. I thought you brought that out pretty well. Well, it's, um, there's a lot of people all over the world that want to, they don't want to just double their money. They haven't got very much money, so they all hope to transform their lives completely. So they want to 10x or 100x their money in a year. And there are so many coins out there that's promised to do exactly that. Who wants to just 20% annual returns a year? What's it going to do for me if I put a £1,000 in? It's not going to change my life. But if it goes from naught to $10,000, it does a Dogecoin then it will actually change my life. And that's what people were looking for. And that's what they were looking for all over the world. And the, the clever part of it was that there was, you know, when, when it was marketed in Africa, it was uh, the big bank, you know, mo the majority of you are unbanked. You, you, you don't have bank accounts. This is, this is the way around that problem. Or you want to send money overseas. Well, you don't like paying Western Union fees. Well, crypto, one coin will allow you to do it immediately for nothing. So she was able to tap into these things. Some of them were universal, like 
there's an element of greed. They are victims, but all of them wanted to make a hundred times their money in a year. So there was there was you know the fear of missing out was the underlying driver of this scam, and fear of missing out is partly driven by greed. It's also driven you know she exploited it. She lied. She conned people. She tricked people. So it's her it's her fault. But she was able to tap into that deep sort of FOMO. And with a with a, a flavour for each country where it was marketed in such a clever way that that you never want to say admire it, but I think you can step back and see how clever it was. Yeah, and I really want to talk about this because those dynamics of kind of cult like thinking seem to be on the rise, and it seems to be connected to to tech, to the social media universe, to kind of the fact that things can kind of. Um, accelerate that you can have these kind of zero to to one kind of explosions of interest in certain things even the terminology we're using like follower on twitter or followers on online is kind of suggestive of cult like thinking Mm -hmm. and it also reminds me of the 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 set of videos that i did last year about london real and which was also a scam like it was it was a very i appeared on london real twice (laughs) (laughs) You didn't have to say that. But I know. I your, thought you might as well be honest about it. Your confession is yeah, noted. A long time, a while ago. Yeah, a while ago. Um, and I, I was struck as well, just thinking back, that Brian Rose also, when he came up with this idea for the digital freedom platform, that was basically him pocketing the money and then running a daily motion plugin within his own website, also said, "Oh, this is going to be based on blockchain. It's got a blockchain kind of." Um, component to it, and we've got to have. So it was sort of part of the. It was part of the scan that it was going to be kind of crypto based or blockchain based. What What do you think this says about kind of? Do you think there is something about the nature of the online world and tech that leads itself to these kind of dynamics? Uh, yeah, maybe the 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 impossibility of any one person really understanding how the tech actually works. It's a religion. Uh, you know, it's like you have to put your faith in it. How, do Do you understand how? Like actually, how IP addresses work Are you properly? I mean, I don't. It, it's it's kind of magical, and I wonder whether uh, technology has transformed our life so much. Like how much we rely on it for so many things. I mean, Google Maps to get here today, what a miracle it is, and how it's sa- it's helped me in every. You know, <laughs> so many times have I been saved by Google Maps. No idea how it works. Don't really understand who designed it. You know what happens behind the screen and yet it, I like de- does my phone know where I am dependent on <laughs> it I'm dependent on it and there is a sort of sense I th- you know can, you can well imagine one day that we, we we almost pray to the sort of algorithm you know let the algorithmic gods be good to me today I mean, someone had posted this on Twitter that he'd was speaking to an uber driver who said yeah have you had a good day and the taxi driver said yes the algorithm's been good to me today and I thought oh it's so creepy but I totally understand it because there was one time where Amazon had just randomly decided that it was going to offer my book on Kindle for 99p. So I shoot up the charts. I'm like, thank you, mysterious algorithm, for giving me your blessing. So I think with complicated technology that has so much power over our everyday lives, like who we meet, where we go to dinner, where we go on holiday, who we fall in love with, is all determined by machines we don't understand. So is it that weird that when a new one comes along, like crypto, we sort of fall into the same pattern. Oh, this thing is going to save us and it's going to control us. And And I think when you add to that the the narrative of crypto, it's sort of anti-bank. It turned up, obviously, at the right time, 2009, just after the financial crisis. Anti-banks, decentralised money, Federal Reserve just printing money constantly, inflation is going to harm your savings. There's a cabal of politicians and bankers together who seem to always get richer while we all get poorer and here's this weird technology I don't understand but other clever people seem to be saying it's an answer Mm. I can understand why you would people would go for that and that those that lead the charge that you have to sort of have to become the figurehead because you don't understand the tech become godlike figures to you don't question them you don't understand their brilliance Elizabeth Holmes is a similar sort of story, and we all get sucked into that. Yeah, there's a um, is it Arthur C. Clarke who said any technology, any certain su- point of 
Su suitably advanced is, technology yeah. is indistinguishable <laughs> from, from magic. From magic yeah. And you could kind of map on religion to that. Like there is a worship. Yeah. That, yeah. That almost, I, I can imagine like, yeah, prayers and offerings to the, to the God of the algorithm. That's why I, I truly believe in it won't be long before people do it. Well, firstly, people will uh, desperately try to change their behavior to please the algorithm. So it will start that way. In a similar way, in medieval times, that you'd, you know, you'd try to do certain th you know, certain number of prayers and the rosary to, to please that when you go to purge, you know, if you're going to end up in perjury, uh, purgatory, sorry, I'm too focused on the one coin story, purgatory, uh, get the monks to say prayers to you so God will let you in. And I, you can see people think, you know, like, I need to learn how to make sure my YouTube channel do is well judged by um, YouTube. So I've got to put in certain keywords and do certain things and put it online at a certain time. And you're already changing your behavior to please some technology that you don't understand. And it's not much of a jump before we have sort of offerings and prayers and all sorts of the real trappings of religion. Mm. Ten years. And it's fascinating as well because the fact that the algorithms are secret, like you're right, like we put up our films at a certain time because we, we think that's probably when most people are online in, in the States and that seems to be when they do their best. But you don't really know. And there's whole industries of people telling you how how to kind of game the algorithms or how to make sure the algorithms kind of look on you favorably. But because they're a secret, no one really knows. So there's a kind of catechism almost of um, yeah. exalted knowledge and people totally. decoding what God really wants totally. from you. And that's a, totally. that's a really the, great analogy. The, the, you can push monk, it. Yeah, the monk the, and the sort of a, and only a, a small number of bishops and archbishops could speak the language to translate the Bible to, to, to you, the ordinary person. And you're there thinking, how am I going to, what do I do? I don't know. Um, and uh, yeah, and so that so that there is there is that. I mean, but throw on top of that the fact that with with crypto in particular, uh, there is something really interesting about it. There is something, uh, I, I like the idea of digital money that isn't controlled by anyone, but that has some kind of sort of decentralized mathematics that means. Uh, everyone can kind of monitor how it's used and it's, it's an irreversible ledger of transactions. It's an idea that's just about understandable to most people uh, and kind of makes some intuitive sense. Like, if, like when Bitcoin went on its first big surge in 2013, it was after the Cyprus bank haircut, um, you know, it's sort of forcibly lopping off a percentage of ordinary people's savings. And I think a lot of people who'd previously seen Bitcoin as the money of drug dealers on the dark net uh, or weird psycho uh, of weird um, uh, sort of crypto fanatics suddenly thought, you know what? The idea of, polit of politicians running money doesn't sound that good. This idea about mathematics running money kind of makes a bit more sense because it's immutable laws. I could see like you can... You can kind of predict it. There is a predict a predictability about its supply. Uh, and suddenly, you know, it, it made sense to people. There was something about it. And I think it's the same with blockchain technology more generally. And I think that's why so many people really like it. You must have found that was it John Oliver said, Crypt cryptocurrency is everything you don't understand about computers combined with everything you don't understand about money. And what crypto i think does is is i've never had so many interesting conversations about what money is what money could be what's the essence of it why does it work uh and that tells me there's something really interesting about it so uh, you know so, so th those those who understand it and those who seem to get it and who who seem to offer sometimes offer you financial advice because you know that's what people really love when they give you good financial advice are treated like gods and I, I understand it. And but Ruja Ignatova, I think, like most scammers, has a, a an incred like a genius, an instinctive genius for understanding human psychology and seeing that, and knowing that the vast majority of people won't know what I'm talking about. If I look the part, if I say the right words, if I say blockchain, distributed ledger, future of money, uh, bankers, inflation, it will be just enough that people won't have to answer, you know, they won't have to ask any more questions about it. 
So she really understood how to take those uncertainties um, and say just enough to be able to convince enough people to invest. So the idea that online, any Godwin's law online, that any conversation, if it carries on, will inevitably turn into an analogy about the Nazis, there should be a kind of crypto version of it, which is any conversation, if continued long enough, will turn to crypto. <laughs> in in certain circles, yeah. for sure. And yeah. I'm I'm not a naysayer of crypto. Like I'm fascinated by it. And I think it is a a genuinely kind of revolutionary concept. And ironically, I've told more people about crypto probably back from 2013 onwards, and com- kind of turned a lot of my friends onto crypto while absolutely doing absolutely nothing Tell myself. You one thing. Everyone has a has a crypto horror story as well. I could yeah. have bought I was told about such and such in I bought Bitcoins at three hundred at three hundred pounds, I think. I like, think that's like the thing. Everyone so. has their like yeah, when did you buy Bitcoin? Oh yeah, four hundred was it? Yeah, I bought one at three hundred. <laughs> <laughs> and now you how many have you got left? No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean that's the thing. The thing about the sort of crypto horror stories is that it always assumes that you wouldn't have lost them, had them hacked or sold them. Mm. It's like I would have had a million pounds worth of Bitcoin if I'd adjusted. Like, oh, you probably wouldn't have done that, would you? You'd have lost them. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's been a good way of distinguishing the one marshmallow people from the two marshmallow people, right? Like, the yeah. people who, yeah, people with with decent um, delayed gratification versus those without it. And I was definitely someone without delayed <laughs> gratification. Um, yeah, but yeah, the the analogy is a very rich one of <laughs> religion and cult like thinking online. And I know that you've been, you've been kind of writing about this, looking at this. And the internet has been, it, it's not just crypto, it's also kind of conspiracy theories, it's QAnon, it's so many of these other kind of um, religious ways of thinking. Like this has been something that I've been fascinated about for a while. It's like, I feel like we're in, we thought we were in post-religious times, sort of secular times, post-religious times. And I think the birth of the internet and the kind of, elevation of a lot of more fringe narratives or things sort of in the cracks of the culture have shown that we're not like we're definitely not in post-religious times in a way like anything can be raised to the to the level of a religion cryptocurrencies being one um well, maybe even, it has to but we need it we need things to fill that yeah yeah for sure like i think yeah. it was a very naive kind of rationalism that thought that we were kind of post post spiritual or post-religious and actually this has shown that no no we religious thinking is everywhere it just may not be in the forms that we expected yeah that's um, right yeah. How, how have you felt that that's linked in well, yeah. your work well th- there's the obvious sort of tribalism in politics that i think is like getting a bit bored of talking about it you know like it's 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 politics as sport it's you you join a team and you don't care about what the other person says and uh, wh- one of the things i think really annoys me about that discussion is It often turns on one or two very basic things. Uh, Echo chambers. You are constantly surrounded by people who think like you. Guardian readers share Guardian articles. Telegraph readers share Telegraph articles. And you get locked in your own little sort of filter bubble of information. I don't know about you, but that's not how I see it at all. I think I've never, ever been uh, more capable of seeing alternative viewpoints. I feel like I'm constantly surrounded by them. But I think the problem is uh, a a basic information overload that we all have to deal with forces us to make such simple and heuristic judgments about right, wrong, my team, your team, tend to think that idea. It's very difficult to engage intellectually on a deep level with information now. Um, And... But the other bit of it is, is the, I think all of us have a tendency to want to caricature the people we disagree with. Like it's, it's, an, it's, it's the people who I think are wrong about things. I get great joy in seeing their stupid, idiotic, like, uh, you know, outspoken worst versions of them on the internet and sort of decide that that is who my opponent really is. That crazy guy who's spouting some like lunatic communist idea or something like that. Like, God, yeah, that is what... No, I'm caricaturing your opponents, basically. And um, they, some people call it nutpicking, choosing the worst possible opponent and that's taking that to be how everybody thinks. And I think that is a more significant driver of sort of tribal politics than surrounding yourself with like-minded people. 
Uh, and, and, and so it's a completely different dynamic. It's that we're constantly arguing with each other. But the marketplace of ideas doesn't allow us to, it's too quick, it's too distorted to ever allow for a synthesis of, of argument. Um, so I think there's, um, there's, a sort of, there's other dynamics going on that we don't really talk about. Um, we always hear about, you know, the, the Facebook and Google's advertising model means that, you know, attention spans are at a premium and clicks always win, which means lowest common, common denominator information rises to the top because it's more emotionally engaging. Some of that, we've just it just gets talked about an awful lot. But I think underneath that, something more fundamental is happening, that we are turning into a more emotional society. I think we're more a more visual society. We see many more videos now than we ever used to. We are sort of less literate. We spend less time reading deeply, which is associated with all kinds of, you know, empathy and, you know, willingness to understand alternative viewpoints. And I think becoming a more emotional society means we're more likely to have knee-jerk reactions about things, we're more likely to fly off the handle, kill at this mad anger over every story, like the constant outrage over everything, the inability to correctly apportion anger. If you think of anger as being quite a, an important thing for citizens to sort of manage, if you get equally angry, if you get as angry about catastrophic climate change as you do about um, someone used the wrong pronoun on Twitter. What, I mean, how's, how is politics supposed to sort of order different people, you know, what society's bothered by? But we seem to be so sort of emotionally charged constantly and we're becoming a much more emotional society that I think it's really skewing how we engage with ideas. And I think that's a lot deeper than Facebook's advertising model. Mm. I think it's a kind of inability of basic human cognitive capacity faced with information overload. Mm. And it just requires quite a different way, I think, of trying to understand our relationship with information. Yeah, because obviously Tristan Harris, the social dilemma is the thing that's probably kind of mainstreamed that argument for a lot of people. But in that, like part of it is, so you're basically saying you, you don't think the idea of sort of filter bubbles really works because actually it's a bit more complex than that but another part of the argument as i understand it is like the what they call the race to the bottom of the brain stem that it's about kind of limbic hijack it is optimizing for outrage and that kind of more emotional um engagement with the world so would you agree with half of it no, yeah i agree i agree that's some of the story mm. i agree that's some of the story and i think but i think it's uh, i think it's been a, a, an accidental byproduct and i think that when you Focus entirely on on algor sort of algorithmic techniques, um, you know, fine tuned. Uh, uh, um, how to describe it? Sort of fine tuning of websites to maximise engagement by the nanosecond to keep you switched on and all the rest of it. I think it overlooks that the sort of the, the human algorithm, the sort of our own cognitive biases, I think are way stronger than all of those things by far. But are um, they playing on those cognitive biases? Yeah, of course they are. Them? Yeah, of course they are. But we also have some responsibility over them ourselves. I mean, I think that if you, if you put it this way, if you got rid of the, the of Facebook and well, let's say just got rid of Facebook and YouTube um, or got rid of their advertising model, do you really think that the level of anger and rage would be like dramatically decreased? Because I think what would be going on is we going we would be going out finding things ourselves that really appeal to the to, to some of our cognitive biases. Um, I, I don't well, and sharing it with each other. Like if you probably look at like what is the most aggravating thing, it's probably news stories that have been shared by people's friends on social media. Well, let me tell you an example of. This is sort of a, a bit of, a, of what I think is going on. To I spent a lot of time with Tommy Robinson, the leader of the English Defence League, and a few other groups after that as well. Um, oh, and um, everyone used to say that he is a he's classic sort of fake news merchant. He just all he does is spend lots of time surrounding himself in like conspiracy forums and. Uh, and, and got getting wrapped up in this anti-Islam worldview because he just keeps reading like, like, like 
sort of Alex Jones type conspiratorial uh, online sites. Right, that is complete rubbish. That is not what happens at all. And that's because I spent so long with him and sort of watched how he works. The vast majority of the of the links he shares are from reputable news outlets. Or they were. I mean, he's changed over the years, but they were. He would be sharing true news stories about bad things that are happening, about the fact that in Sweden an asylum seeker had murdered someone and something had happened and he wasn't deported. And then some other thing about Dr. Hook wasn't deported from the UK. And then something about the fact that there was a uh, a, an inquiry found that the local authorities in the north of England had sort of been so scared about upsetting minority groups that they hadn't fully investigated allegations of child sexual abuse. By all these stories were, that were actually real, but he was just, and they were from good news sources. But he was just cherry picking them. He wasn't being pushed them. He was going out and finding them all. People were sharing them with him, and then and then he was sharing them with the world. And he was able to like create. Um, he became obsessed with this. He became obsessed with Islam because he just he was able to cherry pick news stories about Islam 24 hours a day and nothing else. No, no other story was he interested in. So, he, so for him, it just became this overwhelming sense of invasion and everything's going wrong and it's all about Islam. And it wasn't because he was sitting in conspiratorial news. It was because he was able to go and find stories. And when you read a newspaper before, at least you had a balanced media diet about lots of other things going on in the world. And that has been destroyed by the internet. But that's not quite the same as race to the bottom, you know, race to the bottom of the brain stem, you know, force playing to the, your, sort of your, your basest emotions all the time. So it's, it's a bit more than that. It's just this sort of breakdown of the control over information that we have. And I think that happens quite a lot. People become obsessed by one thing. And it's a lot easier in a world of total information where you just have access to everything at all times. And that's more than Facebook. That's more than YouTube. And when you kind of sketch it out like that, it sort of seems more difficult to... To, to deal with. I mean, it's the su- sort of su- it's the sort of super salience issue that we're in. In the same way as you go into a supermarket, and we're assaulted by all of these different kind of primary colours, and this to our kind of evolutionary back background, like all of those primary colours signify kind of ripe fruit, or they're, they're something that we would have seen very rarely, and suddenly we're just being desensitised and overwhelmed by the environment we've created for ourselves. Um, is that is that kind of yeah. a similar version of the same argument? Yeah, it is. It, it's just, it's it's um, it's an in. I think it's all the way I sort of look at this is all the various institutions that society had kind of built up over the last hundred years to try to control and manage living in a complex, you know, complex uh, um, democracy, representative democracy was all based on a sort of analog, geographically based world where there was relatively limited information that could be sort of controlled and has suddenly, the same system has suddenly basically been overwhelmed by the flood of information and nothing we've built has can really control it. Like cybercrime goes unpunished, the meat, like... I mean, the the idea that our, our education system is, is is even close to being able to teach people about information literacy is i mean we're just miles off if we did live in a true crypto society it would become depending on what government did it would become very very difficult to ever control the flow of information and that is important sometimes being very difficult to tax people and without tax you can't provide services and then what's the point in having representation in the first place there's just so many things where we've sort of built systems up and they just don't seem to work anymore and I totally agree with Tristan Harris and the others that like part of the problem is a an incredibly powerful small number of companies that are based on trying to control your attention. I just think there's a lot more going on. And you've been kind of looking at these dynamics. Your book, People vs. Tech, kind of looks at this throughout all different areas of society. How do you summarize that thesis? Like that... Just as an inc- in a simple sentence, there's an incompatibility between analog representative democracies and digital technology. I think it's that simple. 
uh, is rep- what, why, what we we seem to think representative democracy is um, some kind of sort of set in stone, as if it's obviously the best way to run a democracy. But really, it just was became a necessity as soon as societies were too big to sort of have other forms of direct democracy. You know, it's it's a it's a sort of sixteenth century, seventeenth century invention, and bef- but we now actually live in a world where the idea of a direct democracy, uh, where everyone gets to vote on things that matter to them, is actually possible again, technologically possible, and it wasn't twenty five years ago, not properly, and it is again now, and I I think it's almost inevitable that we'll get to that. I don't think that's necessarily a good thing, but I think it's inevitable because when you think about the amount of choice and control that people have as consumers now, infinite information choices, the ability to choose any product you want, whenever you want, delivered to your door, go and rate it within five minutes, and then compare that to what we do as citizens when we vote once every five years. It's a ridiculous gap has grown between the two. But 50 years ago, like you, your life as a consumer and your life as a citizen probably felt a bit more in sync with each other. You didn't have that much control as a consumer either. So the two seem to me to be totally out of balance. And I just can't see today's 16-year-olds when they are the... The, the rump of society in 20 years' time. Be like, no, it's fine. We vote every five years. And, you know, we all trot over to the polling station. We just tick one box. That's all the feedback we give every five years. We don't even get to write in, like, what we thought. We don't get to judge each manifesto. We just tick a box and go home again. So I just... The comments on the manifesto? Where's the comments? Thread? Like, why aren't we... This is what I've never understood. For example, why don't we... 25 million of us go over to like the polling booth once every, I keep saying five years, whenever it is, because it changes a lot, obviously. But let's say every five years we go to the polling station and we put our vote. Why, why aren't we taking advantage of that opportunity more? Why don't we uh, get to judge uh, how well the last mob did and how, well, how much we liked each manifesto from each political party? And why don't we get to write something in the bottom about our views on what really matters? Because one tick doesn't seem like it's enough to sort of express what I thought about the last five years, what I hope about the next five years. Maybe I loved some part of the Lib Dems manifesto, but mostly I like this part of whatever party's manifesto. Why can't I do that? And I just don't, and, and the technology is available to do that. And I just don't think today's 16 year olds will let that happen. It will seem ludicrous to them with the choice they've grown up with. So it, I think it has to change. And it will have to become more direct. Yeah, it's a fascinating idea because what you're saying is that basically because technology has given so many different options in so many different areas of our lives that something like politics just seems completely outdated. It reminds me of a story of, of some friends of mine who their, their toddler gets really frustrated that he can't touch screen on the telly. Like he's so used to kind of watching stuff on iPad where he can touch screen that when he's watching something on the big the big screen, the TV keeps going up and try, and he gets frustrated that he can't control it. So it's kind of this same dynamic of we just assume that everything can be interacted with and get really annoyed that we can't interact with it. I know. It I've even done that on a photograph. Like when you see a photograph and you're like, oh, God, what am I doing on a physical <laughs> photograph? So I think it's even, even us old timers are doing it a little bit. But those big demographic changes, I think, will really... You heard the thing about the, whether you ring the doorbell with your finger or the thumb as a generational thing as well. I mean, I don't ring doorbells ever anymore. I just yeah, phone no, people when yeah. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Which you'll do with your thumb. So basically, yeah. there was a big shift between people who were not phone users, were tended to still use their finger, but then there was a generational split once we all started becoming phone users and then suddenly we're, we're all ringing the doorbell with our thumb. Interesting. It becomes kind of the... Yeah, and I, I just think there's... A, so big demographic shifts of what people are used to growing up have a really big impact on the politics they then expect, I think, when they get to later life. And they, we haven't seen that yet because it's all been so recent. We're probably both of like have got one foot, me and you, in the old world and one foot in the new world. Like I didn't have a phone when I was a teenager. You know, and like as a young person... 
we'll all reminisce now about it. You know, what, how great it was when you used to phone up on the old phone and agree to meet on Saturday at nine o'clock and there was no way of knowing if anyone was going to turn up or not and all that stuff. But I then became an adult as, the, as, as not even smartphones, as mobile phones were coming around. And so I've sort of, we may be the sort of, in a way, luckiest generation um, and I'm guessing we're roughly at a similar age. So one day, can you imagine our grandkids, if we have them, will be saying, oh, granddad, like, you lived before the internet. What was it like then? What was it like before you had a smartphone? Oh, wow, really? There's just so few pictures of you around. <laughs> and they'll want to know what life was like and we will be the last generation to ever remember a life before that. And so we might be in a quite unique position to... Try to advise, yeah, and advise on why things sometimes are better without this technology. And like we might, quite a privileged position, I think. So, uh, and I've got a lot of views about what it will be like for our generation when we're very old. I've got a lot of views on what we'll be doing and, you know, sort of how we'll engage with the information footprint we we've left behind. consciousness to the metaverse by then or not? Some of us definitely will, of course, 100%. Because we've become all quite narcissistic because every day we turn on Facebook and it says, share your story. What are you doing? Tell your story. Tell, you know, like we're so constantly primed to be telling everyone about ourselves uh, that the idea that we go and disappear will just be intolerable. So we'll, we'll have to have, um, I mean, there's no doubt everyone's gravestone will have a QR code where you can go on there and then download your edited highlights reel of your life. Because I don't want to, I mean, I'm probably going to program some kind of bot. So when I go, it will just carry on insulting people <laughs> that I don't like for, for eternity. So, you know, there'll be all sorts of clever things we can do. But it, it will inevitably have a big impact on politics because I, I think that is... like I, we, When I see, for example, the way people talk about Brexit, I didn't vote for it. Why should I have to deal with it? Why should... Like, it's not my decision... That's not ever been what democracy is about. But the amount of choice we have in our daily lives now, it feels like it should be, which is why it will tend, I think, towards more direct democracy. It'll still be the same problems, but people will at least feel like they've got more say. I mean, the interesting thing is what type of politics does direct democracy favour? Mm. And it's interesting that a lot of radical right-wing parties not radical right or sort of anti-establishment especially who feel like the mainstream doesn't account for them are in favor of digital like digital voting you know mm. digital direct democracy it gives the, more opportunities yeah it opens it up for more people they feel like they've often misrepresented uh, they feel like um without wanting to sort of overdo the analogies with like Mussolini but like the voice of the great people like me as the leader, I represent the people, the silent, downtrodden majority. I'm sure he would have been a direct democracy, digital direct democracy fanatic. Because he would have said, this is a way to get to those real people. All those establishment stooges and all those nasty people. This is my way of getting to the ordinary people underneath them. Uh, but that's a different question. I mean, that can go either way. But I, I just think that's where it's heading. And... I'd love to, topic, really. Okay, sorry. I'd, I'd love to talk um, about kind of other sort of religious forms, like conspiracy theories, for example. I spoke to a mutual friend of ours, Carl Miller. Um, I spoke to quite a bit in the summer about <laughs> what he was seeing by, he was doing a lot of kind of quantitative research into um, online groups and saw particularly sort of suddenly a, a coming together of different narratives, especially kind of around May last year, where groups, sort of far-right groups that were never kind of talking about vaccines before started suddenly talking about vaccines. You saw a lot of QAnon stuff start turning up in natural health, the kind of phenomenon of conspirituality. And it was a... And he he kind of said it feels like an ur uh theory, like a kind of un, a universal kind of conspiracy narrative coming together. Very kind of influential QAnon yeah. in particular sort of became this yeah. incredible force. And you can understand why it would do, like... Why would you not want to be on the front line of fighting for the future against a cabal of paedophiles? And like, it's such a compelling narrative. You can understand exactly why it kind of takes over. Um, I know you've got a kind of backstory with with conspiracy stuff online. I think 
he kind of yeah. began with a lot of 9-11 conspiracy yeah. theories. Me, me and Carl, actually, me and Carl Miller wrote a, a paper called The Power of Unreason about uh, why we thought 9-11 truth movement uh, specifically, but conspiracism online generally was seemed to be growing and, 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 and why it was growing and why it mattered. And that we thought that online conspiracism would would keep would become a bigger and bigger movement, and it would be sort of wrapped into other movements. Mm. And we got we basically went round to the Department of Education in about two thousand and eleven or twelve, and told them like we really think this media literacy is a problem because there's a lot of sort of compelling nonsense online, and there's a lot of people on their own who are creating narratives based around all sorts of stuff, and they're finding a real sense of community in those groups. And this is going to become a big problem because we're just not teaching people how to engage with this information. And we basically got laughed out. I mean, no one took it seriously. No one thought it was a big issue at all. Oh, yeah, we're all already dealing. We, we, already, teach, we already teach media literacy because we show people the difference between tabloid newspapers and, you know what I mean? Just rubbish. It's still frustrating. That. But not, not that I would have necessarily known what to do about it, but at least it might have got on the agenda earlier. But conspiracism, <laughs> it's, it's obviously an endlessly interesting subject. And there's, there's things like, there's more, there's more at play than just there's a lot of misinformation and uh, sort of the natural cons- the natural conspiracy mindset is to f- sort of draws on the human ability to pattern spot. Mm. Sort of you you find s- sizable and seismic events going on in the world need an equally big mm. explanation behind them, and it's not enough to think just some people flew a plane into some buildings because the whole world changed. So it has to have been. An enormous plot involving thousands of people, powerful people, the same with Diana, the same with the moon landing. Every big event needs an explanation of equal magnitude, which is one reason uh, um, they, they're they always surrounding big moments. Every big moment has to be sort of complexified, if you like. And what the internet is amazing at, it's the, me- it's the messiest picture of all. Because there's so much information and claims and counterclaims everywhere. So the natural tendency for all of us is to find a pattern within that. And you've got hundreds of thousands of people out there who do nothing but do that. They just spend their day trying to figure things out, piece things together. They saw something on a blog here, tied it to a blog over there. But then what happens is a sort of a community dynamic takes over, a sort of we're all in this together. I'm finding my people. It's really friendly. People, I've spent a lot of time in online forums. I mean, I spent a lot of time in neo-Nazi forums and 9-11 truth forums and even like eating disorder forums and darknet forums. And what people don't realize is how friendly they are, how nice they are, how they know each other, not personally, but they know the, the pseudonym they, it's a meaningful relationship they have. They look out for each other. They ask about each other's kids, what's going on. You're more than just your, the ideas. You're part of a community. And that is more power. That's really powerful. So conspiracism became, uh, it makes sense in a world of infinite information. And when you allow people to then get together virtually to talk about these things, it becomes something way more powerful. Uh, one of the interesting things about the 9-11 truth movement is why is it all men? It's 95% men. Why? If it's a pure, like, an objective analysis of the fact, why is it so skewed towards men? And I think you mentioned it before, a sort of, a lot of people like to be the hero of their lives and be part of a grand struggle. I think this is one of the great problems in society. Or we're constantly surrounded by a consumer culture that tells us how amazing we are, how we're worth it, how we've got to be bold, we've got to be brave, we can do anything, we just do it, impossible is nothing, and all the rest of it. And then our lives are often quite drab and dingy. But you can switch on your computer and suddenly you're a superhero. You can have hundreds of followers, you can be investigating what the CIA really knew about the And I think that sense of being part of a movement and going back to the sort of idea of we needed religious, we need some replacement for religion, this is part, this is a great movement that you can then become part of. And Carl is right that the big the, there's so many different conspiracies. It was only really a matter of time before you wrapped them all into one. I mean, there was always, in a way, the Bilderberg group that were controlling everything. And, but 
the more that you can sort of plug in your different conspiracies into the grand conspiracy, the more information you got to play with, the more groups you can join, the more communities you can be part of. Makes sense. Yeah, and then there's also the the kind of the monetization <laughs> of that as well. Like at, at the center of it, there are quite a few people with financial interests involved. We had a, a guy who was part of our, came to one of our courses, who was actually part of the, the David Icke um, community for quite a long time until he saw at the center of it this sort of like, oh, actually, a lot of this is directed at making money. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's definitely true. And, and, and maybe that's one of the things the internet has done uh, that is that is quite new in this world, it has provided the opportunity for people to monetize those beliefs quite easily. It's very hard to run a a newsletter about the Diana uh, uh, death or the moon landing that could reach millions of people that, and they'd, they'd pay for it. But I guess if you can run a YouTube channel where you can sell ads against it and make $100,000 a month because you've got millions of viewers who like your shtick, um, You've directly monetized, and then you sort of professionalize if you monetize the industry. So suddenly, your conspiracy theorists aren't don't seem like a bunch of crazy people. They have really nice offices and really good, like professional stuff and good guests and good production value and so on. I never really thought about it that way, but that probably is another angle, like the ability to monetize these beliefs. So what was a hobby has been able to become a profession, but I imagine that is still only true for the small number at the top you still got to attract wider millions of people still get drawn to it and still want to watch it and still believe it and still engage and still comment and share and all the rest of it and so there is something else underneath the monetization which is people still love it they still want to be part of it yeah and i i have to say i mean i think there's a difficulty in talking about conspiracy in a sort of generic way um because i have some sympathy with some conspiracy theories. I don't believe the official narrative around JFK, for example. There's a lot that I think went on in America in the in the 60s, like the under the undeclared war against the counterculture, that I think has kind of reverberated to the present. I think a lot of dodgy stuff was going on yeah. that, that is yeah. kind of like there's a reason why people think yeah, that yeah. these these things happen. Yeah, and also there's often a seed of truth in a lot of these these yeah. things and. Uh, you wouldn't be able, conspiracy theories wouldn't be so popular had there not been cases where what was once declared a conspiracy theory later turns out to have actually been <laughs> the truth. But still, a conspiracy theory is, I mean, there are lots of definitions of it, and it's usually a kind of a, 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 a straight and total rejection of the of any official narrative and of an irrespective and irregardless of the evidence and usually to the benefit of a tiny number of powerful people that no one can sort of ever see so you you would presumably say well the one the conspiracy theories that you have some sympathy for are based on an objective and quite careful reading of them yeah. and i'd have sympathy with that too but too many of the conspiracy theories I see, they're not based on that at all. And they would say they are based on that, but I find it very hard, and maybe some people watching will uh, disagree, but I find it very hard to think that the idea that um, 9-11 was the job of the US government is based on an objective analysis of the facts or the likelihood and like sort of a reasonable understanding of how human nature in the world actually works. But the the thing that I've kind of... I remember reading about QAnon 18 months ago, and I remember reading it and thinking, oh, my God, this is... This is perfect. Like this is deaf. This is going to take. This is going to take uh, take off, because I think, and it, it's interesting to use the kind of analogy of a virus, which we yeah. which we now have, kind of obviously, kind of great examples of yeah. kind of viral spread, exponential growth, all that sort of thing. And when I looked at it, I was like, okay, I think this kind of narrative, QAnon being a good one, it's not about intelligence. It's because hugely no. intelligent people will will kind of. Find find extra reasons to believe something like that. What it is, I think, is a disconnect between having seen either government or media up close and seeing how they actually work. Like, I think if you see government and media as a kind of undifferentiated block, 
then you can kind of posit or you can believe like this kind of a ability of coordination that could pull off something like 9-11 or something like QAnon. When you've actually seen it up close and you've either worked in it or you've just interacted with it in some way, you're kind of like, no, that's it just doesn't work. Like There's too many competing factors. There's yeah. too many. It, it, it becomes too Definitely. complex. But then I thought, well, how many people have this view of media or government as an undifferentiated mass? And I was like, 80%? Yeah, most people. Like most, most people. Yeah, um, and, yeah. and that's not a judgment. That's just an observation look that that's not part of most people's lives. So then who, well, are, the, who are the potential yeah. hosts for a virus like that yeah. is actually quite a large Definitely. number. Definitely. I totally agree with you. And things like the death of local newspapers might play into that. Mm. Because if you, you're more likely to be up and close with actual real-life journalists investigating low-level th- you know, you kind of understand how journalism works. And if, it, if all your news becomes national news through cable TV, you're so disconnected from journalism as a profession that it does become just this, you know, these sort of wealthy people lecturing at you. And also if the decline of <laughs> local journalism means that people can get away with more stuff in your yes. local area, which, it does, you are, which you, it does, yeah. you are being exploited more and more. And I think a lot of it is also based on a right intuition that you're being shafted. Like I think even QAnon like, yeah. is... is uh, metaphorically has some truth like you are being you, you are being bled dry by a system that has does not have your best interests at heart like in a way if you've got that intuition of kind of basically the system sucking you dry in so many different ways then manifesting that as a particular group of people makes sense and then suddenly you, you concretize a kind of metaphorical situation Definitely. i think a lot of that and also the intuition that specific things you are being lied to about Definitely. and then you fill in the gaps and i think conspiracy for me almost always thrives in the gaps between the official narrative and 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 the the more messy reality yeah. um 911 being a perfect example like what we don't know very much about what the saudis knew about it if you look at kind of the the 911 commission it was there was a huge holes in what it was trying to do because they were basically trying to make it bipartisan so it yeah. became politicized like yeah. it was not an objective kind of yeah investigation into the truth no. so there are these holes that yeah, then get yeah, filled absolutely. with I, I, I did a debate with Alex Jones about night about this right I am really not qualified to answer questions like that. <laughs> in, the same, in the same way that uh, I'm not, and, and, that, and you're not qualified to answer questions about structural uh, demolition who is it who is qualified are demolition experts and structural engineers and you know what the overwhelming majority of them say oh, oh the global warming's man made and real <laughs> Architects for 9-11 Truth, a rabble of a few, you know, a handful of architects who actually don't know much about structural engineering at all. Hold on, that's it. Hold on, hold on. Stop, stop, stop. Architects and engineers for 9-11. Hold on a minute. And all I ever said to him was, why don't you apply the same unbelievable standards of truth you're applying to the official narrative to your own narrative? Because your narrative has got more holes in it. And look at it that way, which is the more likely of the two. I mean, why would you trust Alex Jones, who we know monetizes his content so he can sell stuff, uh, his narrative more than, you know, the, the account? And I always say to people, like, if any journalist that I knew thought for a moment there was a story there, they'd be all over it. It'd be the biggest story of their lives. Yeah. So it's, um, I totally agree. I totally agree with everything you just said. Which is one of the reasons I was interested in conspiracy, conspiratorial thinking. And I think all of us have a tendency towards some of it as well. Um, <laughs> but I sometimes wonder whether there's, there's something else uh, going on as well with, with the internet. And correct me if, I mean, if you disagree. I, one of the problems with having all information available at all times is how easy it is to demonstrate where people in power have been hypocrites. So if Joe Biden says something or Boris Johnson says something or Theresa May or Jeremy Corbyn or whoever it is, has a statement which has any sort of, is asking anything of you. It says you should reduce your carbon emissions or it says you should pay more taxes or it says you shouldn't send your kids to private school or whatever it is, anything that's asking something of you. It is now so easy to find a, an example of when they'd said the opposite or when they've done the opposite, because all of it's now available online. So everyone in any position of power 
constantly is accused of being a hypocrite. So why should I listen to you? You're a liar. And it's impossible because you can't live public life without having change of mind and having. But when you see someone say something, like the number of times you see like an image of them saying something and then an older image of them having said the opposite. And you think, what bloody lies? What else are they lying about? And I, this like politics seems to me to be coming a hunt for like other people's hypocrisy which means I don't have to listen to a word they ever say. And I think that might be partly driving the conspiracism. It's like they're all a bunch of liars. They're always lying. They never tell you the truth. What else are they lying to you about? And like you say, when 80% of the people have never been in or more have never been in politics, and you know when you speak to your friends or family who aren't involved in any of this, just the way they talk about journalists and politicians is so different to how I see them. So you can totally understand it, yeah. Yeah, and I know there's going to be people um, upset about the 9-11 stuff because there's always a lot of... Um, oh, you can edit comments. it out if you want because uh, I, can't, I don't want to deal with it. I did debates with, with, yeah. um, with 9-11 truthers. And, you know, one of the frustrating things about it was what they did was they went, went through Demos's website, went through everything Demos had ever been funded, found an example of when Demos had been funded by the government 10 years earlier... And then basically said, Jamie Bartlett is a shill who works for government. Uh, how am I supposed... Oh, and the Demos logo is an eye, that bloody eye, that all-seeing eye. That, you know, part of, you know, again, part of some big conspiracy. But, but what are you supposed to do? Well, how are you supposed to argue with that? And nothing I said made... And like, I swear to you people, I, I don't know. I've never worked for government. And what you're talking about, oh, you would say that, wouldn't you? No, uh, I mean, the one thing I would say is I've yet to meet... Because there's always the conversation about, oh, well, the official narrative. It's like I've yet to meet pretty much anyone. Well, I've had this conversation many times, like the 9-11 conversation many times. And I've yet to meet a single person on the kind of conspiratorial side who's read The Looming Tower, which is the... One of the best, one of the best books I've ever read. Incredible book. Incredible, like primary reporting about kind of the run-up to 9-11 by Lawrence Wright. Pulitzer Prize winning. Brilliant. And it's like you care enough to go to war about this, but you don't like online, but you don't care enough to actually read like what is the official narrative? Like the official, there's so many different official yeah. narratives. Yeah. There's the one that was kind of in the 9-11 commission. There's the one that was hiding the, the role of the Saudis. There's the one that was like there's, there's so many kind of. And then there's a few things I've rarely been able to hear a kind of answer to. It's like, OK, this all powerful plot that was able to kind of take down the Twin Towers and create this casus belli for war in Afghanistan and then Iraq, why could they not fake some something to tie Saddam Hussein to 9-11? Like, if this was a supposedly all-powerful cabal, why could there was this kind of half-hearted attempt to Mohammed Attar may have met an Iraqi intelligence person in Prague and they spent ages trying to pull that together. It's like, why could he not create some... This is what I'm saying, though, about that their narrative has way more holes in it. And all yes. I ever asked was, could you just judge your narrative by the same standards as you judge for whatever you think of as the official narrative yeah. and look for the same Why holes in yours? Why would you not make yours? some of the hijackers Iraqi if that was the <laughs> idea? You could do anything you want if you're setting yeah. the whole thing up, couldn't you? Yeah. One of the things with all conspiratorial debates, and it's actually true of the English Defence League as well, is many of them become fanatics and obsessed with the detail. So if you actually try to debate with someone, they, they, unless you are so well prepared, they probably can take you down because they'll say, well, have you read the such and such a report in 2007, which found that blah, 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 blah. And you know what temperature still melts at? Well, according to this thing, it melted at this. And you are like, you can't deal with it because you don't have time because you're not obsessed with that one subject to read as much as they do. So we need people who are like the anti-conspiracy theorists who who become as obsessed with the detail as that because you because you're not and then you as the official spokesperson are sort of blustering, you can't answer all their questions, you sound a bit evasive, you're not really sure what happened and they're like, "Oh yeah, well." Yeah, another person that's just a media shill who doesn't really know what's going on. Which is what happens sometimes when I debate with Tommy Robinson. Are you just part of the mainstream media trying to silence us? Don't actually know all the details, do you? Of what's really happened? So there is a there is that if there's actually a weird information disparity. Like I judge it based on what I understand of the world and how I know politics works and how I know people work and systems work. They are judging it on very very small technical details, yeah. 
And that's um, why I think ninety five percent are men, because yeah. I think it's nine eleven is really about losing yourself in the in the very kind of precise detail. It's like melting point of steel, or yeah. kind of it's to do with like it's almost a, it never, it's very architectural. It's about the collapse of the towers. Mm. It's never about well, does that fit in terms of like what we know about the war in Iraq or geopolitics or the con- contextual. Well, Linking of these it's things. It's really high and really sense. low. Like, it's like really tiny details that they'll get into, like you say, the melting points and all the rest of it. Um, uh, and, and they can out argue people on that. And then they link that to the really high stuff. Powerful people are always lying to you, like the really vague top level, the world's corrupt. And there's this big middle bit. How do governments really work? How does journalism really work? How do people really work? How do you keep a secret that 20,000 people would have had to have kept? It's impossible. Another good example, Uh, the Saudis, the embassy killing. Like they couldn't keep that a secret in their own embassy in Turkey that then kind of leaked out over So they missed the middle bit. They missed that huge middle bit. Um, But focus on the top and the bottom. And maybe we're like just middle people. And who cares about the middle people? It's boring. The top and the bottom's fun. There's a kind of general belief, particularly on YouTube, that the good ideas will push out the bad ideas, given and that and so and I completely agree that censorship is the worst of all possible worlds. Like who would do it? It's a slippery slope. It's it's a sign that something's definitely gone wrong. We don't trust the big tech platforms to do it. But the idea that the solution to the information crisis that we're seeing at the moment is more information or more speech seems unproven at best, mm-hmm. given the fact that we've just got proliferating amounts of information. And as you just said, like the, I think it's the bullshit, Brand- Brandolini's law, which is that it takes more time to refute bullshit than it does to produce it. So therefore, you're going to have ever-expanding bullshit. Well, we have automated bullshit machines that just automatically content generation of absolute rubbish at yeah. like infinite speed. What's your take on, on that sort of that big picture of um, what the solutions are to... The, well, we, I just think we're going to be living with this problem. I don't think there's a solution to it. I've stopped trying to think how do we fix the marketplace of ideas, but how do we just live, how do we sort of muddle along as best we can? Because we don't know what works. We don't know. We, there's just so much we don't know about it. We keep like suggesting silly things like ending online anonymity, which I think is a mad idea that wouldn't work, be really detrimental to so many of us. Um, and yet we see some bad stuff online, and that's we like leap for the lever that we have. Mm. Right, let's make sure everyone's a, you know we know who's who online. I mean that's just so bad, so, so bad. So I agree with you that the the liberal assumption, the sort of the the warm liberal assumption, is that yeah, marketplace of ideas. John Stuart Mill, thanks very much. Clashing ideas, we reach a synthesis, and good ideas will te- will tend to win out. Among most people, most of the time, I don't think he ever thought you'd diminish it. But I imagined a debate where there's a lot of people who are fence sitters, and that's who your debate is really for. Although I like debating, not necessarily to win or lose, but to illuminate a subject so people can walk away feeling like they know more than they did when they went in. But so much debate isn't that, is it? It's like destroying such and such owned you, and I. I I quite enjoy watching the odd YouTube video where someone gets owned. <laughs> but it's just like, it doesn't illuminate anything. It doesn't actually get anywhere, but it's just there's a joy, there's a weird joy in it. So I, I, the marketplace of ideas, I think, never really worked. That probably was always a, an assumption we had. You know those studies like where you take a group of people who believe in abortion, a group of people that don't, they talk together for an hour and then they both walk away believing more stringently than ever that they were right and the other side was wrong. I think the internet has worsened it because the, the, the quality of debate and the speed of it is I mean, it's even worse than ever. There's no real long-term engagement. And there's a few studies about how do you actually have a proper debate where you come to see the other person's point of view without necessarily agreeing with them. It's just really expensive. You've got to get together. It takes weeks. You chat. You get to know each other personally. You spend time at each other's houses and you begin to realise that the person you disagree with is a real human being and has a reasonable perspective on things that's just different to yours. And I can live with that. What I can't live with is these crazy idiots on the internet. So I actually had this idea of having like a, a speed dating, but for political ideas where you'd actually meet up 
different views and you'd really listen. You weren't allowed to you weren't allowed to disagree, just ask questions for ten minutes. So you'd get an EDL person and a Jeremy Corbyn person and you'd actually listen to them for ten minutes and you just ask questions and that would be it. And the idea wasn't to win or lose a debate, it's just to try to listen to where other people are coming from. Uh, didn't do it because it was too expensive and took too long. So I th- then maybe there's some little things like that that we could do, but I don't. I, I I'm a bit of a free speech absolutist myself, bec- only because um, I think it's such a precious thing that any small infringement on it, I think I react irrationally about it. You know what I mean? It's as if you're insulting my, you know, my religion. So I think a lot of people go absolutely crazy at the smallest sign because they're so they think it's such a precious thing they're so worried about it that even the slightest like denting of it or criticism of it is like blasphemy and that's probably the the wrong thing to feel but uh, and I know you probably thought I wouldn't say that cause, but I, I do feel like a bit of an absolutist on it because I, I think it's it's just so important to protect um I th- the other bit of censorship that i do worry about that lots of us do is 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 uh, is self-censorship obviously like the fear that we you live in a panopticon you want to say something you have a strong view on it but you're kind of scared that maybe your office is going to get a phone call saying that this guy thinks x y or z you're going to get fired or other people will insult you or people will judge you this is why online anonymity is important and i think there's a lot of people that have strong views that would somehow improve the quality of debate if they only spoke up, but don't want to because they fear the consequences of it. And as a result, the overall quality of public debate is lessened because so many people don't really want to say, they just lurk and watch and get worried. But then what happens is the most outspoken versions of that who are brave enough join in and scream and shout and they're told that they're really brave and really bold and really outspoken and contrarians. They're often saying things what a lot of people think but won't say because they're worried about the reaction. So they get like extra prominence but they're the most radical version of that view. And so the debate becomes polarised because a large chunk in the middle doesn't want to sort of put their head above the parapet. And that's why you know Nigel Farage becomes a kind of outspoken hero of the people because I think He's not saying anything that a lot of people don't otherwise think, but then he becomes prominent and he's the most radical version of it. And so that's what frustrates me. Like when you have a big chunk of the mainstream who don't want to speak, the people who do become like the really polarizing, aggressive people versions of that argument. So, and self censorship, I think, is an important part of internet life. And I, and I, and I guess that. The job is for the moderate people to speak up sometimes a bit more about what they think or if someone they think has got a point actually say that. Yeah. But that's hard because who wants to get cancelled? Who wants to, you know, lose their book deal? Who, and I'm not saying I've got all these like crazy views that I get cancelled for, but I, I just see it because I, I don't. I'm actually quite vanilla. But I see, I think I see it in what's going on there and it, it's a bit frustrating. Yeah. You've opened up another really fascinating Does that make sense, topic. though? I'm not yeah, sure no, no, no I, think it's, I think it's absolutely crucial. And I worry in particular about mm-hmm. kids or teenagers who are growing up now and how how it is for them. Like, I, I feel the same. Like, there are some things that I'm generally pretty outspoken. I don't have a boss, so I think I'm able to... I almost see it as my duty to sort of say stuff that, that I believe because I'm in a, I'm in a relatively yeah. privileged position. Yeah. Um, and also... Yeah, I, I I really wonder about kids who are growing up in this environment now. Like, even I feel that kind of like concern. But a fourteen-year-old or a fifteen-year-old who's growing up on social media and like just not able to explore ideas, not able yeah. to kind of we're not allowed to be wrong. Yeah. Like, there, there may be ideas that we that we're having that we don't feel able to express, and then that's how they get moderated. Like, yeah. we, we maybe express it, we don't express it quite that well, or we kind of moderate it over time. But if it's not expressed at all, it just goes underground and becomes, yeah, um, yeah it, it becomes more septic. I mean, this is another fascinating yeah. topic. Totally. No, but I agree. That's what, that's what, there's, there's something big going on there. Yeah. And, it, and I feel like it's worrying. I think we don't really know what people are thinking out there and they don't want to say what they're thinking. And that's when you get surprised by Brexit. Yeah. Go, wow, all these people thought that. I never even knew one person that was going to vote for it. Like, why aren't I seeing that? Why aren't we talking about it? Why aren't we engaging with it? 
And so you have this stuff lurking underneath and maybe the QAnon is the, is the same. And, uh, and then it kind of comes out in this huge fury and you sort of that moderating influence of what big wide debate's supposed to be where you disagree, but it's amicable and then other views and you can see there's a big spectrum of opinions. That's, that is what is supposed to moderate views. Airing those views is supposed to moderate them and we don't do that very well now. And then they all just come out in these like mutated ways. People are monetizing it. Other people are being contrarian because no one else will. It all becomes really clashing and the, the, the middle's gone. Um, and I, I don't know, yeah, maybe, yeah, we need to fill the middle again. But that's it's an easy thing to say, isn't it? But it's not easy to do. Well, we've worked out we're both middle people, so. Who's going to listen to us? Nobody. <laughs> Jamie, it's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you'd like to join conversations like this, check out our digital campfire. You get access to a load of member-only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes, and you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below and we'd love to see you soon.